Well, um, essentially this talk is called Things I Wish Maker Square Had Taught Me. Not that Maker Square didn't prepare me or Maker Square didn't do anything. Maker Square was great. Everything was awesome. The only thing is that there's going to be stuff that you're going to have to learn through experience. And anything I say today, you're not going to remember. But sooner or later on the job, you're going to encounter this and it's like, oh yeah, that fat guy was talking about it and he made us laugh. Maybe. I don't know. I'm bombing right now. So we'll see as we go. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, this is very loosely organized. If you want to ask a question, if I haven't clarified something, that's fine. Um, I meant to say you should ask me, and that would be fine. Because if I haven't clarified something, that's not fine. In fact, that I've done a poor job as a communicator in doing so. So um, I'm basically presenting four disjointed, unrelated topics on engineering delivered by me, a person with lots of issues in a stream of consciousness format where I can't promise I won't digress and end up talking about the Victorian infatuation with tobacco rectal inflation or the inter-party conflicts inherent to the Irish parliamentary system. <laughs> so before we begin, stop me if you get bored and you want me to move on. I've got several points in this where you might have already covered this in Maker Square uh, because the curriculum has changed since I came here. I know you're talking about functional stuff that might come in, uh, that might have been something that wasn't in my class that I thought you guys should know, but they're teaching you. Uh, so whenever you see this, should I skip? Uh, if you guys just want to shout, skip it. If you want to go on and you don't find this interesting, you can just let me know and I can go on. Uh, I don't know your names, so when you ask questions, I'm just going to point to you. I, I apologize. Uh, I didn't have a chance to go over the dossier. So uh, we'll just go with that. So topic one. Your job hunt after Maker Square. Uh, it is frustrating. There's no way around the frustration. It's going to take you some time. It's going to take a lot of effort. I can tell you this much. Uh, the system, that crew, I don't know if you know who crew is, Caitlin, all those guys have in place, it does work. Uh, people in my cohort, I think the longest time it took for someone to get a job is six months, and even uh, they were saying, hey, that's mostly my fault. I didn't do the things that Caitlin and crew were telling you to do. So do them. They're going to seem crazy, but they do work. So in a lot of ways, it's a numbers game, and they'll definitely help you through it. I'll also let you know this. Not only did a maker scroll help me get my first job, uh, but when that job turned out to be a poor fit, helped me get my second job. So it is definitely a good thing that you're here. Um, so your job hunt. Well, you guys are going to come out of this as novice developers. So as a novice developer, they're not looking for credentials. They're not looking for uh, particular stacks. They're going to be more interested in what you've done than where you went to school or where you work, anything like that. So you have to be prepared to show them. That means projects. That means your thesis projects, most especially. Uh, I've been able to, uh, I believe that my first job hired me specifically because my thesis project was an edutainment product uh, designed in React. And they were working on an edutainment product designed in React. So I think they brought me on board because of that. And uh, that was huge. Uh, also, I had some other uh, projects before then. Uh, and uh, that helped out. But mostly, um, it is about what you can show people you can do. Um, that means GitHub is your resume. Like, I actually was on the other end of this. I was uh, helping someone hired, someone get hired at uh, my first job. And the first thing I always look for is GitHub. If it's not on the resume, that resume already loses a couple of points. If there's nothing impressive on GitHub, nothing like that says, hey, he's tried a bunch of stuff, or she's tried a bunch of stuff, or she has these really cool projects, or she made a contribution to this project's open source, even if it's just documentation. It is vitally important to be able to show that you can do the job. Um, if you can do it, get a personal site, just a blog, talking about different technical things you're learning. Uh, GitHub pages using Jekyll is fine. I don't know if anybody's covered that, but that's one space. WordPress, another one's just fine. Ghost is fine. Um, the other thing is that we know it's going to take time. 
it took time for me, it took time for a lot of people in the cohorts leading up to this one. You can't always shorten that time. You can do everything you can to shorten that time, but you just can't sometimes. Sometimes it's just luck of the draw. So instead of bemoaning that, you gotta use that time. So you need to study, you need to make, you need to catch up with your family because family's important and they have puppies and puppies are cute. <laughs> but don't forget to keep applying five times a day, it does work. So your post boot camp study. Um, online courses. If you learned well through online courses, through the videos they have here, uh, there's front end masters. I don't know if you still have this, but they gave like every one of our graduates a year free. Uh, and that's great for anything front end. If you want to refresh React, Angular, um, I don't know if uh, I don't know if Backbone's on there. I do think Ember's on. No Backbone. I, I'm seeing a thumbs down. That's a thumbs down for Backbone. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's okay. No, I'm, 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 I, I, I started this le lecture by saying I hated Backbone, so everybody hates Backbone. I think Brian Masters has a Backbone course. Don't like, do it. Yeah. Uh, if you are interested in learning languages from a video, I, I do like the Plural Site track. Uh, it's a little pricey. It's about $40 a month. But you, if you wanted to basically go through kind of a self-motivated course with another language, like Java's always a good one to, uh, to take on. Or C Sharp, in case you know, you're looking at a place that is maybe a Microsoft uh, shop. Or Python, in case you're working in academia, or with uh, hip startups that like to use Django. So uh, Udemy, uh, if you're into game dev at all, and this is absolutely fine. Uh, if you're into game dev, Udemy has a lot of really cheap, really good courses. And Coursera or edX does a really good job with, with more formal computer science. Um, books, we got Pragmatic Bookshelf and No Starch Press. Uh, they're pretty good. They're just my favorites. I can't like say that they're objectively better than anything else. I'm just saying that I've read them and they're good. Um, add to your own open source projects. Create your own. Work on your thesis even afterwards with your team. I mean, that would, that's impressive. Everybody kind of goes off on their own, unfortunately. Uh, my thesis team moved to uh, Miami, and um, and I forget uh, where uh, Peter moved, but we all, I stayed here, and we all kind of fell apart. And I really wish we had like continued on that path uh, and done that. Not because I just miss him. That's why I'm here. I miss this place. I mean, you guys probably hate it by now because it's week three, right? And you're you're all exhausted. Um, trust me, by week three, week four, you will be tearing your hair out, and by week twelve, you won't want to leave. Um, but uh, there is one thing, you probably all kind of knew this in the back of your head. This is something that you need to consider very seriously. Um, as I said, I keep mentioning my first job, and I've only been a graduate for nine months. Something went wrong, and what went wrong is that I avoided, uh, I, I ignored all the red flags. So here are some red flags that you guys are going to want to see before you take on a job that you feel kind of iffy about. First of all, do they have source control? You would be surprised how many places don't have any source control. It's less than it used to be because it gets so damn easy. Uh, and that was a laugh line, but don't worry about it. The Git is actually kind of easy. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's no source control, they're sending files via email or FTP or something like that. Um, no unit tests. I know you guys hate unit testing, everybody hates unit testing, but they are really, really important. I'll get to that later. No daily builds. Um, people work on their stuff kind of in isolation, they have no idea if it works together um, because they don't do a daily build. No bug database. Bugs get sent around, hey, this is a bug in email gets forgotten, nobody remembers it, nobody keeps track of it. Jira is a good one, but you can just use an Excel spreadsheet that everybody shares, so long as it's all in one place. Um, there's no spec, no specification. So one person thinks that the project is A, one person thinks the project is B, you're gonna get neither A nor B. You're going to get the unholy mutant child of A and B. <laughs> and as an unholy mutant child, I can tell you it's no fun. Um, <laughs> No testers. Uh, this is actually not true if, uh, if it's a smaller organization. First of all, every developer should be a tester of their own code. 
Every developer should be going to code reviews of their own code. But when you get to a larger software organization, like maybe 20, 30 people, there should be someone whose full-time job it is to test um, and not a developer. Someone to test from the end user perspective because as developers, our brains have been molded, in this case by Makersquare deliberately, to think about things like a developer does, not like an end user does. So sometimes we miss things and testers are very important. Uh, no code reviews. If your place doesn't do code reviews, you're not really going to learn a whole lot at that job. And they're not going to really see what you're capable of as well. So no code reviews is a big red flag. Uh, you were not actually asked to code or whiteboard during your interview. That's huge because I know you guys can do the work. You know you guys can do the work. They don't know that you can do the work if they don't ask you to code or whiteboard, and that means they don't know if your coworkers can do the work. So you might take this job and be essentially taking on double duty uh, for somebody who basically bluffed their way through the interview. This is a uh, uh, last one: is engineers do not have administration or pseudo access on their development machines. Uh, this one is very specific for a reason. Um, I worked at a place that literally did not allow me to install fonts on my computer, my work computer, um, especially since I was also dabbling a little bit in the graphics and the UI and that design. I could not actually go into Photoshop and install a font to make the mock-up to show people what it would look like. I would have to verbally describe the font because I couldn't install anything that requires administrator access. Um, this was not feasible. And in the long run, this drove a lot of people crazy, including myself, um, as you can clearly see. Um, Google the Joel test. It was written by um, Joel on Software. It's a very popular blog. And in 2004, most of these are taken directly from there. And these are designed to be the red flags for a CEO to tell if his company is working great. They're also red flags for jobs. Now, if you find like one or two of these things and the others are all right, if you are going to be in a position where you can start doing things the right way, um, let's say that they don't have any unit tests, but they ask you to come in and basically be the lead on unit tests, that's okay. Let's say that they don't have code reviews, but they really want to do them and they promise you yes, we will do code reviews every Friday as a condition of your employment, something like that. Um, so red flags are not deal breakers, but they are there to warn you. And this is what happens when you ignore them. <sighs> that poor biker. Um, after you take that first job, you might come up with a few other red flags. Like for example, source code is CVS or Subversion instead of Gitter Mercurial. This isn't really a deal breaker, but the idea of branching code bases came in with Git and with Mercurial, Mercurial, it's just more efficient. Subversion, you have to be always connected to the internet. Only one person can check out one piece of code at a time. There's no real branching or merging, which is the big thing. Um, and this is less a problem if they say, oh, definitely moving to Git is on the roadmap versus we just moved to Subversion so we can't get them to switch again. Um, that's something there. Uh, the application, their key application, is written in an in-house proprietary language that no one else in the world uses. Again, um, this does happen. Like they will, people will come up with an entirely in-house programming language, program their application in that, and then expect you to come in and, over the course of three years of your life, learn that programming language because there's nothing you can Google on an in-house programming language. There's no books on an in-house programming language unless the person who wrote the programming language also wrote the book. It's probably going to be a thick book. Uh, it's not going to be fun. Um, company has no marketing department. I know that uh, there's like a, a, a line between engineers and marketing, but mar I actually come from the marketing background before I came to Makersquare. And I can tell you, marketers are important. They tell you whether or not what you're doing is something people actually want. <laughs> and if you don't have a marketing department, you can end up creating a product that nobody wants or needs. Um, 
finally, company looks company's website looks like it's from 1998, and the CEO tells you that they did that on purpose. I have no explanation. <laughs> I'm just telling you I'm speaking from experience. So these are all real things that do happen. Now that said, that said, if, if one of these things happens to you and you can still code in JavaScript where, while the crazy guy with his own language is off doing his thing or her thing, honestly, it's usually a him in, in, the, in the crazy language case, but, some, but you know, um, because, I, I, because, you know, they were like probably there since like the 1970s, the 1960s coding in like uh, ancient Lisp on uh, tab machines. So this does happen. Uh, I apologize, but it's real. Um, so here's how to tell if you're working for an accidental Ponzi scheme. <laughs> now, <laughs> when I say Ponzi scheme, I'm not talking about the illegal type of Ponzi scheme. Uh, I'm talking about when the company's development cycle kind of feels like a Ponzi scheme, not a literal one. Uh, in most cases, Ponzi scheme companies aren't breaking the law or being bad people, but they just, they didn't intend it, but they got into a bad hole and they just kept digging since then. And that's uh, most importantly when the company uses the money from new clients for new features to pay developers to fulfill old promises for old features for their older clients. This is a warning sign. This is something that you really have to worry about if you're working there. Because someday, that, that's, that gravy train is going to stop. Some of these companies have gone on for 20 years like this, but you don't want to be left holding the bag, to use a cliche. I don't know what, what's in the bag or why that's a cliche or what it means to actually <laughs> hold the bag, but you don't want it. Nobody wants it. Nobody knows what's in it because they don't want to get caught holding it and you have to hold it in order to open it. <laughs> I've lost myself. Um, uh, again, software you're working on, something nobody asked for, nobody needs, nobody wants. But your company makes it because it shows off the capabilities of some fancy vaporware that is the company's big thing. Um, by the way, uh, you notice that I haven't named the company that I worked for. That is on purpose, because they're all actually very good people, even the CEO. And when I say even the CEO, hi, CEO, uh, I, they really are just sweethearts. Um, these are some of the things that I found that meant that I didn't fit in there. And there might be some of you who actually think, hey, a proprietary programming language? What a challenge. Um, and that's great. I, I would also say, if you ever are in this situation, don't trash talk uh, about your former or current employers because they can hear you and Austin is a very small tech community and there's the internet which is a thing and people talk to each other on the internet so you notice that I'm warning you about these things that the a lot of these did happen to me but a lot of them didn't and I'm just telling you about the generic stuff okay so that's topic one. Topic two, programming paradigms, or why you should focus on JavaScript now, but as soon as you feel you're able, branch out to a new language. So here are your programming paradigms. You have functional and object-oriented. I'm sure you guys all know functional ob and object-oriented because the lecture when I came in was on functional and object-oriented. Um, but what I'm really referring to here is that there are some languages that are more functional or more object oriented than others. JavaScript along with another, they're right in the middle. This is why I think learning JavaScript as your first language is just brilliant. You learn uh, more or less the C language syntax um, with the brackets and the braces and the functions and it's all nice. But you also can code in a variety of styles. So you can try out some functional stuff. You can try out some object oriented stuff. And there is absolutely no reason um, to not learn what you can experiment. If you taught this course, say, in Haskell, which is completely functional, you'd miss out on all that object-oriented stuff. 
If you taught it in Java 7, Java 7 doesn't even have lambdas. Java 7 doesn't even have closures, I think. I think they brought lambdas and closed closures in for Java 8, but I'm not sure. In fact, um, one of the reasons why Kotlin exists, you notice I have JVM there, it runs on the Java virtual machine. Someone wrote a language that was designed to be more functional. And then someone else wrote a language which was designed to be even more functional to run on the same Java virtual machine as Java. So this is definitely not like a case of technology. This is a case of preference. This is a case of paradigm. Um, so what is the difference here? Well, it's kind of hard to explain, but functional programming, I think, is best when you have a fixed set of things and as you build, you add new operations onto those things. Whereas object-oriented is when you have a fixed set of operations, and then you primarily add new things, which use those operations. So, you want me to go on, or should I just skip this? More. More, all right, that's the spirit. All right, functional programming, as you know, avoids possible immutable states. It's easier to write high-performance multi-threaded applications because since they're not keeping track of state, state isn't changing, you can kind of have your one thread kind of lagging behind and not really worry about things. So with the advent of multi-cores, functional programming is kind of taken on a new life. Um, uh, it's been around for longer. Uh, oh, I, I actually, that was my next point that I did before. OK, let me rewind here. Around for longer, but taking off now because of the move for higher clock speeds, higher cores. One of the great things I like about functional programming is that it's not just testable, it's provable. Since there's no side effects, you're going to get the same thing every time. You can prove your program works. And if you do that, then if there's like an argument where your boss is like trying to assign blame somewhere for something that broke, if you can say, my code works, I can prove it, that's nice. It's very nice. Object-oriented programming does use classes which inherit from one another. It does save you a little bit of boilerplate. Um, classes do most often have immutable state, and sometimes you want a mutable state. React is all about mutable states. I mean, like, it, it's, it's basically the mutable state um, uh, front-end framework. So uh, additionally, if you're working with any prior code in your organization, 99% will be object-oriented. And that's because of a long and varied history of, um, of Java in the workplace, uh, of this object-oriented paradigm having like kind of taken over everything in the 1990s. Like back when I went to college, like 1997, object-oriented was the hot new thing. And so people used it for 20 years, and now they're realizing, hey, there's other ways to look at the world. So if you're looking at older code, Chances are it's in Java, or it's in C++, or it's in, um, or even like some JavaScript and some Ruby is written specifically in an object-oriented style completely. Like there's no functional components, it's all immutable states. Um, so as I said, functional programming is about adding a new type of thing. And adding a new type of thing to a functional program may require editing many function definitions to add a new case, while object-oriented programming is adding a new type of operation, means you have to edit many class definitions to add this new method to that class. So here's an oversimplified and entirely non-accurate metaphor. You own a car factory. World War II breaks out, as it does every so often, and you must now make tanks, not cars. Or maybe electric cars become a thing which happens in the future and now, hopefully. hopefully. So let's see what happens when World War II breaks out. Well, if you're designing your car factory in a functional manner, you really need to redesign your entire operation to account uh, for the different needs of tanks. I mean, you had uh, a bunch of functions, and now there's an entirely different set of operations that this car thing called a tank is going to do. So you have to redesign around that. Whereas if you uh, work in an object-oriented style, you just create a tank class that extends your SUV class, add on a big gun method and this.armor, and you're, you're done, pretty much. 
you, you basically just take your your. It's kind of like what happened with the Humvee, but in reverse. Like it used to be the Hummer, and then it became the civilian model of the Humvee. Well, it's it's like that. That's ob that's the power of object oriented being able to kill the environment and make Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, look crazy for driving a limousine version. Of, but whatever. But let's say electric cars become a thing. Now the functional guy is like, oh, that's fine. I'm just going to replace my gas engine with an electric engine. It's a, it's a function. I drop it in, I replace it, I go. Vroom. Uh, whereas the object-oriented guy basically has to go through their entire line and redesign everything to take advantage of this new electric engine. So every car on the line has to be redesigned. Um, to kind of give you a not oversimplified and entirely non-accurate metaphor, this is a toy problem that I've solved in two ridiculous ways. You might actually have encountered this. You might. This might have spoilers. I, I'm sure you won't remember it, but whatever. So here's the toy problem. You need to write a function called common characters that accepts two strings as arguments. I, 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 uh, is, is that, that OK? Hey, they just did that. We, uh, we were saying this is kind of cool because we just did it like two or three days ago. Oh, that's cool. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. So you're familiar with it. This yeah. is your test case. Um, ask give you, give you should equal al you. So uh, there we go. So you're familiar with it. So you ignore white space. You return the characters in the order they first appear of the two entries. Now, this is the extremely functional solution. That's it. One line of code. Common characters, yada, 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 concat, PV, reduce, join, all that stuff. Um, this is a little bit more readable version of it. Now, this is ridiculous. It's designed to be ridiculous, but it is one line, and it works. And I know this works because I tested it. Theme later. Uh, now, here's the extremely object-oriented solution. So you have a class entry with a constructor. You get the entry. You set the entry. Concatenate the entry. These are all methods on the entry class. Uh, you turn the entry from a string into an array. You turn the array to a string. Those are also methods. Uh, you check to see if something is included. That's a method. Strip white space. That's another method. Strip the duplicates. That's another method. Now when you go down here to the actual doing stuff part of the program, you've got common characters. You've got let entry equals new entry. String one, string two. Your answer equals a new entry. And then you go. Uh, you basically go through it step by step, turn the entry one to an array, strip out the white space, strip out the duplicates, same thing for entry two, and then for the element of entry one dot entry, if entry one is included, you concatenate the entry into the answer. Um, and concatenate the entry is not a built-in JavaScript thing, that's a method that you built into the entry method so that you could use it for your answer. You then turn the answer into a string and you return it. So both of these work. Both of these are ridiculous. But which ridiculous program would be easier to modify so that it returns all characters that are not duplicates? Yeah, I'm hearing a lot of functionals. You, got, you guys can like shout it out all at once. One, two, three. That's right. You just add an exclamation point somewhere in there. I, I don't want to point it out because I don't want to go through that mess of code again. Uh, I had enough time writing it. Uh, object oriented, I also don't want to go through that mess of code again, but yeah. So which ridiculous program now uh, can you modify more easily to take an array of objects instead of a string so that it returns all duplicate objects? Object oriented. Because if you just basically come in here and uh, you can just add like another method right here. Uh, I don't know if I can type here. I cannot type here. Um, but if I could type here, I'd type in something quick that basically says, check to see if an object is a duplicate. And you can just add that in. So that's the, ex so there you go. So here's what object-oriented programmers think about functional programmers. Functional programming, uh, hold on, let me do a funny voice so that you guys can, can tell the difference. Functional programming makes it hard for programmers to figure out what you can do with the program. Keeping data and behavior separate means that it can be difficult to see the use of either, just like you don't make sentences without nouns and verbs. Also, functional code is so full of chains that you get lost in the whole thing. That's why LISP stands for lots of irritating superfluous parentheses. 
Now, our methodology results in self-contained units of computation, whereas a functional programmer might call functions from all over the place, leaping around the source code as you try to track what's happening to your parameter. <laughs> That's what object-oriented programmers think of functional programs. Here's what functional programmers think about object-oriented programmers. It mingles data and behavior. And if it's tightly coupled, loosely cohesive, lowly cohesive, uh, lowly cohesive code. Why did I type that? <laughs> it's tightly coupled, loosely cohesive code. And if I pass in the same parameters to the same methods, I'm not going to get the same result because any previous function could change the behavior of a class instance. They've got all this implicit environment that you can't carry around with you. You, you wanted a banana, but what you got was a gorilla holding the ba banana in the entire jungle. And that's Joe Armstrong. That's a quote from the creator of Erlang. So what I think about both. Learning functional programming concepts helped me to write loosely coupled reusable code that tended to be smaller and easier to debug and more easily testable. Learning object-oriented programming concepts helped me model more complex operations and break down large problems into smaller ones. They're both important. They're both good. Learn them both. Okay, topic three, test while driven development. Kind of a switch here. This is what I do at ESL. Is um, I'm working on a, a way to essentially automate their tests. They do testing, but they don't do automated testing. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to find a way to make it so that you can run one query and get 140 or so reports back and they all turn out pass fail. Um, but it's really hard. <laughs> it's hard to do that job because when they were designing this system, they did not use test-driven development or behavior-driven de development, or as I like to put it, test-wall-driven development, which is basically not as strict as any of those. Just make sure you have the unit test. Tests are how you can tell whether or not your code breaks things or something someone else may depend on. So if you can, write the test before the code. If you must, write the test immediately after the code. But whatever you do, don't check in code that other developers can use that does not have tests. In an experimental branch or whatever, like, oh, you're going to do your own thing and just kind of just save it to like experimental dash testing dash Boyko or whatever your name happens to be, um, Steve uh, or Bl Blen Blamenda or uh, whatever. <laughs> So that's fine, but don't put it into like the development branch or the master branch until you are certain that not only do you have code to show that it works, but you have code to also let people know, hey, if you change this, this is going to break. Now, here's why you need tests. First of all, they tell you when something you change breaks the code. Or alternatively, prove that when what you change breaks the code, it's not your fault. That's very nice to have, especially when you break the code. It's going to happen. Uh, test well driven development allows you to focus on one thing at a time. Now that's, I know that we all have like these huge visions in our head of uh, projects and frameworks and diagrams, and in my case, the apocalypse. But the important thing is to make sure you're focused on solving one small piece of the problem, have a test for it, then you can move on to another small piece of the problem. Writing tests force you to write in a way that is testable. And I'll get more to that later. Tests are also the show, don't tell version of documentation. If you have tests and people look at the test, they know what the function is going to do without having to like read through tons of documentation. They can just see Oh, this function does this. This function grabs a banana and a jungle. Uh, or this test uh, concatenates a string or whatever. So it's very, very useful. It, it is part of documentation, to tell you the truth. And I, uh, again, don't consider something fully documented unless it has the tests. Um, you can try new things with your code, experiment, branch out, confident you're not going to break existing functionality or if you do break existing functionality, that you do it on purpose so that you can bring in your new feature that is going to be awesome and change the world and make the company millions of dollars and, 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 
and you'll dream about it and you'll meet your spouse uh, through the code and you'll have kids and, <laughs> and have a happy life. <laughs> Sorry, I kind of lost myself there. Um, so uh, it also requires that your code written in a way that is testable. Now testular, testable code is modular. It's maintainable. It doesn't rely on bad things like global variables and mutable states. Well, mutable states aren't that bad if you use them right. Same with global variables. But, for example, well, I'm going to have an example later on. I forgot that I had the example, but now I have the example. And we'll get to that when the example comes up. So part two, they make it much easier to go back and refactor the code you've written, making it look better for the code review. And all your friends and your coding team look at you like, damn, that's good code. <laughs> tests also make it easier to focus on the features of your sprint. If you've written the test and you know, I have to get these things done, I need to get these tests working before I can move on, you're not going to like go down the rabbit hole of tangential craziness. Like, um, like if you're being asked to connect to the database, you're not going to end up writing an entire UI for the database. You're not going to move everything from NoSQL to SQL or vice versa. You're just going to stay on target. You can do all that other stuff in another sprint, but it allows you to keep a laser focus on what you're doing. Um, also, when you, make, uh, when you find a bug and you fix it, make a test. Make sure it doesn't happen again. Because developers can come in and they'll make a change which reintroduces the bug. This happens all the time because a lot of the bugs that uh, are introduced are for edge cases. And Edge cases are those cases that people don't think about. So when they see code that's meant to handle an edge case, they're going to think, why is this code here? That code doesn't do anything. I'm just going to take that out. Well, when they take it out, they have a breaking test and they know to put it back in. So that's, that's nice. Um, dependency injection, a dev's best testing friend. Should I skip this topic or go on? One, two, three. All right. Topic four, junior versus senior <laughs> developers. As a job title, it's kind of meaningless. I mean this. I mean, like, it, it, it's absolutely positively meaningless, save for one important thing. And this is my own opinion. This is not the opinion of Maker Square. This is not the opinion of all the graduates of Maker Square. But I think it's just a ratio. It's about how much mentoring you need to get up to speed in the current organization compared to how much mentoring you're able to give to others in the current organization. The same person can apply for a junior developer uh, position that has five years of experience. You're not going to get that. Because they're looking for somebody who may require a lot of mentoring, but also knows a hell of a lot. Whereas you could also land a senior position right away, because you're not expected to just engineer or develop. You're expected to teach others your specialized knowledge, like coming in as a node expert in a room full of C-sharp devs. Honestly, don't worry about it. Um, truth is, as time goes on, that title becomes more and more meaningless. If, if you are a senior developer, don't worry. You're going to be fine. If you're a junior developer, don't worry. You're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Just strive to be the most informed, most helpful engineer and the rest will follow. So there's a corollary to this. And that is, you can end up with a job as a senior engineer, uh, straight out of boot camp. There is a possibility, though, that the reason you're being brought in as a senior engineer is that everybody else who works there is an idiot. <laughs> and it's easy to look brilliant when you work with idiots. I'm not speaking from experience, Mr. CEO. I'm not. I'm just letting you know this is something that happens. I've heard people. Everybody at company one is fine, and they're happy, and they're all brilliant in their own way. I'm just saying. So I'm sorry, I'm just addressing the camera here. I know that's kind of rude to the audience, but it was kind of important to me to do that, because uh, really that first job did support me in a lot of ways, and I learned a lot there, even if it wasn't good at it. So um, oh, I did tell you I was going to digress. OK, so where was I? Um, yeah, finally, the number one thing to take away. Maker Square is going to make you useful to employees. Don't doubt that. This curriculum works. 
It works better than when I went through it uh, because you guys have nine more months of refinement. Um, I can tell you that they are looking for the skills you have and that if you're here, you can handle the work and you're going to be fine when you get out. And people told me I was going to be fine when I got out and I didn't believe them because I'm naturally neurotic. I don't know if you've gotten that impression. <laughs> But um, yeah, it wasn't just imposter syndrome for me. Uh, I, I felt I was a, a master of disguise. Okay, that's stretching the metaphor way too far. <laughs> Let, let's just say that um, I actually, at one point, was, was scared to leave because I didn't know what was gonna happen and I wanted to stay here forever. A and then um, I took my medication and uh, was able to move on. So. But this only takes you so far. This makes you useful to employers. That's not enough. It's enough for your employer. Might be enough for some of you. It's not enough for me. Your work and study is what's going to make you mighty. And I swear to you, this is true. You are going to learn about as much your first three months on the job as you will in the three months here at Maker Square. Not because of some sort of, you know, secret training ritual that every company has, but simply because Maker Square trains you to learn to learn. And you're going to be doing that without even thinking about it. So you're always going to pick up new technologies. You're, there's always something new to learn. Um, I'm just learning MDX, which is this uh, uh, language which uh, is basically an SQL, but it works with multi-dimensional uh, multi OLAP databases. I don't know it that well. But I'm learning it. Um, I'm learning Python. I'm learning Java. I'm learning a whole bunch of stuff that I never thought I would learn. And when I look at myself as a recent grad compared to now, it's definitely as big a change, if not bigger, than when I entered Maker Square and when I left. So you're always going to be learning. If nothing else comes through here, just your work and study is what makes you mighty, and I want you to be mighty. So I know you guys have been working hard all day, and you came and you saw me, and that's great. I just wanted to thank you all for taking some time. Uh, I know probably most of you want to just collapse and sleep now, so I'm going to let you do that. All right. Um, before I go, does anybody have any questions or want to learn more about dependency injection? Um, probably about, um, ooh, um, well first I'll answer your question. In Maker Square, I was naughty and I poo-poo, like when am I ever going to use tests and I coded from the hip and it was actually uh, Juan Sierra, who was my partner during my thesis that says, we need tests. And he helped me uh, with writing them and making sure they all worked. And I can tell you this much, I look back at my thesis code now, the code that I wrote without tests, and I want to redo it. Um, not just because it doesn't have tests, but also because I've learned so much more. Um, Redux is a thing now, uh, when, and that we didn't use Redux or any flux, so we just passed everything through callbacks. It's kind of a rat's nest of, of functions. But, you know, it's also, the, you know, it also works. It also does well. And in Maker Square, I think you're, the, you're learning so much stuff every day, new technologies, that I don't think it's a problem if you do test driven development or not in this learning phase. Because afterwards, you can definitely learn test driven development. It's not hard. It's basically just a bunch of its and describes and the scariest thing about it is just learning to break down your code and getting used to it. There's a lot of good books on it. I learned from uh, O'Reilly's Testable JavaScript, um, which focused on um, uh, mostly front-end development, but the idea is the same no matter what. So how much testing did I do? 
Um, not enough. I wish I had done more. And um, I didn't. I ended up okay. Um, but that's another, but that's the reason why it's so important to keep learning after your Maker Square experience. And your other question, which I have forgotten because I rambled. Oh, uh, no problem. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, like, how much time would you say you spend, like, in a week or something devoted to, like, learning new technologies? Or, like, does it relate to your work or is it more of a... Um, devoted to learning new technologies, I'd say about eight hours. And that's usually a week, uh, like, every other weekend, I'll, like, go down to Epoch coffee shop and binge on something. But then again, I'm kind of, like, even among the nerds, I'm, like, super nerdy. Um, but... Honestly, that's not the stuff I dedicate to learning is not the stuff that I'm learning the most from. I'm learning the most from doing. I'm learning the most from using. And I would say that every hour you spend programming, you are spending learning. And if you are not spending that time learning, then you are spending that time mastering. First you learn, then you forget. It's very zen. Like, for example, um, I know this is going to sound crazy, but as I said, I kind of got on a big functional, I don't know if I said this, but I learned a lot of functional programming and functional programming techniques. And so there was one point at which the code clearly called for me to write a for loop. And I had forgotten how to do that because I was so used to for each and map and reduce and all of that that I forgot how to write a simple for loop, had to look it up. I mean, it, it all came back to me like within two seconds of the Google, but still, you know, it, it, your thinking changes because it, you're, either pra you're either learning something new or you're mastering a skill you already have. So I would say 168 hours a week you are learning, except the time you sleep, in which case your subconscious is learning, because you will dream about code <laughs> if, you, if you haven't already. Well, who's dreamed about code? Show of hands. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, there is nothing wrong with you. Um, it, it, it never goes away. And some of the happiest code I've ever written uh, is in my dreams. <laughs> that, that, is, that is my question. My dreams about writing code are all completely unsolvable problems because they're made up in my dreams. Does it ever get to a point where like, there is happiness there? Yes. <laughs> okay. And usually that's going to happen not during the dream, but when you wake up and you realize that an approach you took in your dream is applicable to an approach that you took in the code. And um, that's actually something I was struggling all day trying to really get my head around Redux Thunk, which is this type of asynchronous action to work with Redux. It's semi-complicated. Semi I couldn't grasp it. I went home. I went to sleep. I dreamt about Redux. And I dreamt about like this this big ball machine, which tastes like this mutant ball. And it's like, I knew this was Redux, even though it wasn't like on a computer screen. I knew that it represented the, the, the spiritual id of Redux. <laughs> and so when the mutant came through, the mutant ball came through, this, this jumbly thing came out, and it was completely different. And, um, and so the, the mutant basically told me, oh, you're not sending a normal action through. You're sending something which will change over time. That change will happen when the action is dispatched rather than before the action is dispatched. And that was something that I definitely really did have and didn't just make up right now, just to provide a contrived example. Um, so any other questions or? Um, I have a question. Sure. How much time did you spend outside of the actual day here at home working on Maker Square Materials? Zero. Really? Yeah. Because you have to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> you have to sleep and you have to do laundry. Yeah. And, and if you don't do those things, you will get grumpy and the people around you will get grumpy. You must also shower. <laughs> if you have a dog, they need to be played with. And if you're obsessed, you need to find out who's going to win the Game of Thrones. <laughs> Although that's mostly for Sundays while you're doing your laundry. <laughs> um, so, yes, relaxation time is super, super, super important when you are in a program like this. You have to make time to relax. You have to 
if you just keep banging your head against the wall, you're never gonna notice that there's a door right next to the wall where you're banging your head. <laughs> and sometimes you need to literally take a step back. Well, not literally, you need to figuratively stick. Like in this metaphor, the metaphor person is t literally taking a step back, but he's still a metaphor. I'm too far deep. Um, so yes, relaxation is super important. There is one exception. When we got close to the deadline on the thesis, I took a little bit more time on my Sundays to just like go over everything with like a fresh eye. Um, but again, that wasn't the priority for that day. That day was laundry. Um, that day was getting sleep. That was reading a nice book. That was watching a nice TV show. Letting my brain cool down. Because as you know, if fry is easy, it, it really, it, like, you, you see me now. Can you imagine, like, this is me on a 40 hour a week schedule. Could you imagine me, like, 66 hours a week? I, I, I tell you, like, I drove like half of uh, Cohort 21 crazy. The other half were already crazy, like me, so that didn't matter. But, but still, no, I, I needed that time. I think, I think you guys need that time, too. So if, uh, is there like anybody, any questions about anything dependency injection is for a long time? Okay, no, uh, oh yes. So what is dependency injection? Glad you asked. <laughs> um, <clears throat> because you guys don't wanna care about it. This is uh, just something that I wish, like this is the only like technical thing that I do wish that Maker Square had taught me. And that is that you can write code in a number of different ways. And some ways, using this trick called dependency injection, you can write much more testable code. Like, for example, in this top item here, you have import database from database, import config from config, let connection equals database config. This will work. This is great. But when you want to add a record, when you want to test this add record function, you have to connect to the real database. There's no other way to do it. Um, this is testable. What, we, what we've done here is we've taken these, this config and this database and we put them in as injectable parameters. But you have to essentially redefine them for every test, for every use. Ad record is going to take three parameters. You just want something that works like this, but it's testable like this. And this is uh, one of the ways to do dependency injection. You probably already know. So you have this connector function here. And I didn't know that that would happen when I touched that, but we'll let that slide. Now you have this connector function here, and then what you do is you pass in the database and the config like you did up here. But now you're returning a new object with a method called add record. And this is very testable, because you could have a test connector with a fake database, a fake configuration file, so you can test it all day long and not worry about messing up something in production or messing up your, your database. Whereas in production, you can use the code the same way, just with the real data, and you get the exact same thing. So basically, this testable function, you have your test suite here, let fake connection equal fake config, then you just add the record and you expect the rec record to equal done. Whereas in your code, you use it and that's real data, and you just wait for the response, do the stuff, do the rejection if you want that. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is one of the biggest tricks that I learned that they didn't teach in Maker Square. This is like the only real big technical trick. And um, you're gonna probably learn more and more about how to organize this stuff, but this, this dependency injection, the idea of rather than importing everything into every file, you pass them in as parameters allows you to basically create test environments. So if you are working with a database, you can basically just create a, a stub or a mock or a spy and just put that in there. You, you'll get the stubs and mocks and spies uh, later on, I'm sure. So yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier that you thought React um, was all about uh, sort of state changes. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I was wondering, did you mean that that's because it stores the state inside the component, or did you mean, like, I guess, if that's not what you meant, what did you mean by that, and why do you... React, um, whether, how, however you use React, essentially React is a way to manage an application so that it can 
change, it, it can react to changes in some state somewhere. Each component does have its own state and react, and that is by design. Um, there are alternative state managers, like, as I mentioned, Redux, MobX, Reflux, a whole bunch of others that I can't remember right now. But they're all designed to do one thing, and that is remember the state, while React is designed to react to changes in the state. So that's what I meant before when we were talking about that. Um, I don't remember where I picked it up, but I do believe that I, I think this was just like, oh, I realized I can do this one day. I don't know if it was that I read it somewhere and that it kind of stewed in my head while I was watching Game of Thrones and then, you know, uh, just let it sink in. And it's like, oh, I, I can do this and this will work. And I know it works because I tested it. And um, so I, I don't know if uh, where that came from, but that was one idea. I do know that it's actually a huge, um, no, actually now you've reminded me of where it is. Uh, for my Greenfield project, actually, at MakerSquare, we were doing this with Kinex, but we didn't realize that this had a name or that this was a standard pattern in any way. And it was a way more complicated than I made it here. And we didn't use it for testing. We just couldn't figure out how to connect to the database without somehow passing the database itself through. And it was just really weird. And people were actually like yelling at me, you can't do that. No, that's a viable pattern. Um, so as I said, like there are things you're going to learn here that you may have like a surface grasp on. And that's fine. That's all you need. Because when it comes time to actually use these things, then you do the deep dive. Then you start to realize more and more, hey, they covered this in Maker Square. Now I know what the hell they were talking about uh, in week six. I'm still doing that. Um, I'm still like finding out, oh, this is something that uh, Kyle Simpson came and talked to us about with promises. Uh, this is something that, um, that uh, uh, like a, one, of my, uh, one of my cohort mates talked about in a presentation, uh, talked about uh, await async in ES7 and how it like works in C sharp and how Python has, lambda, have, has lambdas that are not like JavaScript lambdas, but they're lambdas nonetheless. Ooh. Um, there's a lot of stuff. And um, that just, and I'm sure there's going to be, enough, uh, like in a year, I'm going to feel exactly the same way as I did now, as I do now. Like, I probably will learn just as much in my second year as a programmer um, as I did in my first. And so, thank you. Um, thank you all for uh, coming to me. I'll answer some questions as soon as I um, basically uh, uh, just pack everything up. Oh, wait, there's a question over there. One, one last one. I'll try to be quick. Um, okay. You've clearly invested a lot of thought in the function. So just thank you. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Uh, all right. All right. <laughs>